1979, Steve Jobs somehow managed to get inside Xerox PARC. According to Xerox PARC scientist Larry Tesler, who gave Steve the tour, Xerox was looking for a partner to sell their new technology. Well, we should partner with a company like Apple, and they'll make our machines for us. So Xerox and Apple made a deal that ended up in Xerox showing Apple the graphical user interface, the Ethernet and the mouse. The common belief seems to be that Apple somehow snatched this tech from Xerox, but there was actually a business deal, possibly involving Xerox getting paid with Apple shares. That's not a bad form of payment at the time, if you ask me. And in exchange though, Steve Jobs required that they get information, a rev disclosure, about everything cool going on at Xerox Park. Long story short, Xerox released a computer with these new innovations, but it was way too expensive and failed on the market. Instead, Steve Jobs put a dent in the universe with the original Apple Macintosh. For this year's Marchintosh, I decided to bring out some weird and unrestored original Macs from storage, and restore one of them. The Mac on the bench here is one of the original Macs with 128K of RAM, produced in week 47 of the release year of 1984. This lucky Mac used to belong to Harvard University. Unfortunately, it had spilled the battery's guts, which caused massive corrosion inside. But being a lucky Mac, it still would boot, and it didn't even blow out the magic smoke from the refund. This is the third video about this Mac. If you want to pause this video and watch part 1 and 2 first, you will find the links below this video. In part 1 we did a full disassembly and some archaeology. We also restored the chassis, the case and the tube. In part 2 we restored some bad traces, replaced the damaged fuse holder and we did a full recap of both boards. Today we are going to continue the restoration, and we are going to begin with the insanely pingy keyboard. Okay, so what stands out with this keyboard is its extremely loud ping. It has by far the loudest ping of all keyboards I have ever tried. Some people even mod these and fill them up with foam to make them a bit more quiet. But we're not going to modify it because I want to have the experience of the original Macintosh as it was back in the day. So this keyboard came with a hardwood machine and we will see if the dates match inside. And the model number is M0110. Well, very dusty. And uh, no dates on this side of the board. Well, there's some pretty nasty dust bunnies inside. So it definitely needs to be cleaned up. Well, that's a pretty complicated design for a keyboard. And I guess this metal chassis here is what makes that loud ping. And I don't think there is an easy way of taking it apart. Because all the switches are soldered to the board. So this is not going to be full disassembly for sure. But I need to take it apart enough to clean it. And I'm going to do all the cleaning and retrobite off camera. Because you have probably seen enough of those videos. Yeah, so the switch is mounted in the chassis. And then soldered to the board. So to take one of these apart, we would have to desolder every single switch on the board. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, because I think all switches are okay. Yeah, the switches are actually not that loud. So I think that ping is generated when these two tabs here hit the chassis. Uh, that definitely makes that ping. You may have seen my recent video about the NABU and the NABU personal computer is using the same switches but with a slightly shorter stem and turned 90 degrees and it's almost as loud as this keyboard 
So we are going to take that keyboard apart in one of the upcoming videos too and have a look inside. And we have one electrolytic cap here. So since we recapped both boards inside the Mac, we might as well at least check this cap. And we have one exposed chip here, so let's check the date. Week 7 of 1984. Uh, there's actually another chip over here. And it's from week 35 of 1984. Okay, so this keyboard is probably the original keyboard that was sold with our Mac from Harvard. So, uh, I think I'm gonna lift one of the legs of this cap and we'll measure it. So let's be lazy and just heat up that leg. So we've got one microfarad 50 volts. And the ESR is 1.4. So that's an okay value. And the capacitance according to my meter. So that's about 15% off. So that cap still has a few years left in it. But let me check if I have a new one. And unfortunately I didn't have one in my stash. Okay, the cap is back on the board. And I went ahead and ordered some. So I won't need any lame excuses the next time. Now let's see how that space bar is held in place. I don't think these caps have yellowed. At least not significantly. Uh, these are some really thick caps. But the space bar has definitely yellowed. And even if I don't retrobrite the rest of the caps, they will need to be cleaned. So a bit of a boring teardown of the keyboard. But it really doesn't make any sense to remove the switches. Okay, let's take a look at that mouse. So this was definitely not the first mouse. But it's very likely the first mouse that people actually saw. And I'm pretty sure this is one of the early ones because it has this older style of connector. My slightly newer Macintosh mouse has a much more modern looking connector. And it's the M0100. And I seriously doubt that we will find anything interesting inside. But as you can see, it definitely needs some cleaning and peroxide. I enjoy messing around with vintage computers, but I want them nice and clean. And this one definitely needs some cleaning. And it only seems to have one chip and what looks like two resistor arrays. And that micro switch is pretty stuck. There we go. So it was held in place with this tab here. And then I think we have one screw here that holds the PCB and everything else in place. Yeah, that's really, really disgusting. So definitely needs cleaning. Yeah, it's pretty basic. So there's not much to show here. So I will do all the cleaning and retrobite off camera. And we can move on and see if we can repair that diskette drive. Okay, let's see if we can fix this drive. So this is a Sony drive. Model number OA D34V-22. And I did some reading online. Um, from what I could read online, this is the second revision of 400k drives in these Macs. But I also found some conflicting information. So supposedly... This Dash 22 drive only works with Rev B ROMs, but my board has Rev A ROMs. So this drive is completely jammed. I can't make it budge. And I think it's stuck in its down position. Because these two plastic pieces for the sensors, they are in a way of putting a disk in. So this is the first time I work on a 400k drive. So I'm gonna have to learn as I go. And some nasty white mess on the pressure pad. So not sure what that is, but it looks disgusting and we'll clean it off. So a quick clean will not fix this drive. So we might as well remove this cassette. 
right away. And it's locked in place with one of these rings. Not sure what these are called. So please comment if you know. And I managed to find it on the floor. Okay, so then we have a washer. And this should free up the cassette. So to remove the cassette, we need to remove these screws down here. And we don't really need to remove the PCB. Although we might for inspection. Okay, so let's see if we can figure this out. Okay, so this piece here is almost jammed too. I think it should fall back immediately when released. But I have to push on it to make it go back. So this piece here seems to be stopping this piece from going back. And the way to release it seems to be to push this piece upwards. And at the same time this piece here should slide to the right. And that means this piece here needs to move. Okay, and this bracket needs to move at the same time, I think. And it's completely seized. In fact, everything is completely seized. It's like it's glued together. And I'm gonna leave it like this for at least 10 minutes. And we'll see if that helps. Okay, so I left it for half an hour. Let's add some more. Uh, and let's see if we can brush that all grease off. Well, the visible grease comes off right away. Uh, yeah, now this piece moves freely. But I can still see some old grease. So let's add some more. And brush some more. And it still won't budge. So this drive has seized up quite badly. So maybe we need to take it apart some more. So now it's in a position where it should be when the disk is in the drive. So maybe it's locked somehow. It's quite complicated. Okay, so I think this pin here is locking the entire thing. And it gets freed up if we push this pin upwards. But it won't budge. And these two pieces here, they are riveted. So there's no way to take them apart. Ah, finally. Okay, so now it moves. Okay, so it was just all grease that had turned into glue. Because now it moves freely. So I think I will add some more and brush some more and then I will soak it and I think I will leave it overnight to make sure that all that old grease dissolves but I think we're all good now yeah it definitely moves freely okay so relatively easy fix and by the magic of video tomorrow is in roughly two seconds Okay, it's the next day, so let's clean that pressure pad. And I have no idea what that white stuff is, but I know that it needs to come off. So let's try with some IPA. I think it's mold. What else could it be? Well, at least it comes off very, very easily. And I think that did the trick. So the only thing left to do here before we can put the cassette back on is to clean the worm shaft and I think Sony used a different type of grease here because this stuff doesn't seem to have turned into glue and aside from that white nasty stuff on the pressure pad this drive is actually pretty clean and that is also something that I noticed when I took the machine apart the tube barely had any soot on it so I don't think that the students had free access to this Mac. Because I don't think it has seen much use. So now we can apply some fresh lithium grease to the worm shaft. 
And I also noticed that the gearbox is partially exposed. So I'm going to grease those cogs too. Okay, hopefully that is enough. And there's also one cog here. And even a Q-tip is a bit too large. But I don't have anything smaller. And something popped off. Okay, so this ring here popped right off. That means we can actually remove it and get better access. So I guess be careful not to lose that very small ring. But now it's going to be properly greased. So now we can put the cassette back in. And then the bracket. And the washer. And then finally this locking ring. Uh, now I think I can tighten these screws. Okay, now let's see if this still works. Well, not sure it does, because it doesn't stay. Yeah, something isn't quite right. Huh. So I think that this pin here should fall down. And it doesn't, so perhaps something is still stuck in this drive. Yeah, I can force it down, and then it stays. So apparently there is some grease still left inside here. That is still very sticky. Let's see if we can fix this. Okay, so our problem here is that when we insert the diskette, this pin here doesn't move up like this. And lock the diskette in place. And when we try to eject the diskette, it doesn't fall down without extra force to eject. So that wasn't enough cleaning. We need to take this damn thing apart again and clean some more. Well, not an easy thing to get on camera. But our pin that got stuck is on the other side of this bracket here. So this bracket here is probably stuck somewhere here. And I'm going to let it soak. And we'll try again. Okay, half an hour later, I think it finally freed up. So if I put the disc in now, it stays in place. And if I push on the lever, it ejects. So that was some really stubborn grease. That's for sure. Okay, cassette back on the drive. Let's try again. And yes, it stayed down. Now let's see if we can eject. Ah, uh, not quite. It does work, but it does take some persuasion. So if I hold the bracket down for about a second, then it will eject. I actually think it gets quicker for every time I push. Yeah, it probably only needs to be exercised for a bit now. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'll skip ahead here. And one more drop of oil was what was needed. So now it works perfectly every time. And it locks in place and ejects immediately. So that did the trick. Well, no wonder we couldn't get that diskette out in part one of this mini-series. Okay, so the only thing left now is to lubricate all the mechanical parts. There's no way we can get any type of grease in that extremely tight spot where we had the jam. So the only thing I can do is to try to grab one drop of machine oil and hopefully it will find its way in between those two parts. And I guess I will exercise the drive while that machine oil settles down. Hopefully in the right place. I guess time will tell if this is the proper fix. But it sure looks like it's working now. And with the parts that are easier to reach, we can use lithium grease where we only have metal parts. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had 
any diskette drive giving me this much trouble. Okay, I think we're good. Since our Mac is still in bits and pieces, I decided to test the drive in another machine. And it would boot once, but then it stopped working. And it actually booted off the original diskette that came with this machine. So this is System 1 from 2nd of May of 1984. However, the drive only worked once, and the Mac I used to try it had Rev-A ROMs. So since a lot of forum threads claim that this Dash 22 drive only works with Rev-B ROMs, I decided to bring this Mac out. So this Mac has Rev-B ROMs. And if we try to boot... It still doesn't boot from the diskette. And I can hear a very faint ticking noise. So if I manually move the heads, they will go back to track zero. And if I hold my finger on the drive, I can feel that it tries to push the head past track zero. So unfortunately I think the track zero sensor on this drive is shot. But the rest of the drive is probably good since it did boot once. Well I decided to do some more tests. And I'm not so sure it's the track zero sensor anymore. Because if I push down this plastic piece to make the drive think that it has a diskette, then the diskette spins up. And the eject cogs here start to move. And it keeps doing this for a little while. And then it stops. And if I give it a push, the motor starts spinning again. Let's move that head and see what happens. Yeah, it goes back to track zero. And if I touch the motor, it starts spinning again. And it takes some force to stop it. Okay, can I set this back on? Let's see how it behaves. Well, it spun up and then it just stopped. And now it doesn't spin up again. And if we move the head, it goes back to track zero and then ejects the diskette. I can still hear that ticking noise. And if I push on the sensor, the drive spins up and then tries to eject the diskette. But with the diskette in place, it does nothing. Okay, I just realized that we can actually check the track zero sensor quite easily. So if I push the head forward and then push down on the sensor at the front. And I will try to stop the head from moving by pushing a piece of plastic in the track zero sensor. And yes, I definitely can stop it. So the track zero sensor is okay. And the sensor at the front is okay too. So why doesn't it spin up when I put the diskette in? And if I boot the machine it doesn't spin up either. I guess I better check that diskette. No, the diskette isn't stuck. So the diskette seems fine. And when I push on the switch at the front, I can give the motor a push. And it will spin up and try to eject the diskette. So something is making the motor very glitchy. And it needs a push to start. Well, since the motor spun up when we gave it a push, I'm gonna put my guess on either a bad motor or perhaps just a bad cap. So I looked through my stash and I found another 400k drive. But unfortunately, this one is bad too. And this is an earlier drive. It's the D34V. And made much earlier in the year. So I guess now I have two bad 400k drives to make a repair video. Luckily I also found this in my stash. So this is an 800k drive. And it works. 
So I gave it a quick clean and some lubrication. And we can borrow this drive for the project until I get a fresh set of caps. Now this drive will definitely not work with our Rev A ROMs. So I pulled these out of my stash. I'm not entirely sure what these are because they are obviously homemade. And they are marked low B and high C. But I think these ROMs will work with the 800k drive. So let's pull those ROMs out from our board. And they're gonna go back in. As soon as I have a working 400k drive. Because I want to keep this machine as original as possible. And those sockets are pretty crispy. So let's first treat them with some deoxid. And let's try out our low B ROM, whatever version it is. There's probably some kind of debug command we could run to check. And the mysterious high C ROM. And hopefully our board will now work with an 800k drive. Well, restored parts are piling up on the bench, so I think it's time for the reassembly. Hello, Epic Tronics. Well, hello, Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. Well, Mac Harwood here seems to be a bit confused. Uh, no wonder after that battery bomb inside. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and click on the patron. Well, I will order some more parts now, and in a few weeks, I will make part 4 where we will try to repair some Macintosh drives. I would like to end this video by saying thank you to my very first patrons. If you want to become an early supporter too, you will find the link below this video. Shall we play a game now? <laughs> Epic Tronics. And now is a good time to watch part 1 if you haven't seen it yet, or catch up on one of the other vintage computer restorations on this channel. Thank you for watching, I'll see you again soon on this channel, <laughs> Epic Tronics.